By the mid-1930s, new strident forces were on the march. These were putting increasing pressure on the attempts to ensure that the world lived in relative peace and harmony, and that there would be no repeat of the awful carnage of 1914-18. The League of Nations was still in place. But the Japanese had walked out of it after their overrunning of Manchuria in 1931. Hitler's Germany followed suit in 1933, and new challenges to the League now appeared. Benito Mussolini's Italy was a different country to that at the end of the Great War. It had a strong government, and on the surface at least, its infrastructure was organized as never before. The Mafia had been crushed in the south, and Mussolini had made much effort to overhaul the country's economy. But Mussolini wanted Italy to be a great power. Resentful that Italy had not been allowed to enlarge her African empire at the expense of Germany at the end of the Great War, Mussolini was determined to make good the omission. He had his eye on Abyssinia, now Ethiopia, which Italy had tried to seize in 1896, but had met with a bloody reverse near the village of Adoa. Italy already had neighboring colonies in Eritrea, on Abyssinia's northern border, and Italian Somaliland, and Mussolini's initial plan was to use friendly approaches to bring Abyssinia under Italian sway. Thus, he supported Abyssinia's application to join the League of Nations, and in 1928, signed a treaty of friendship with Haile Selassie, the Abyssinian emperor. He, however, wanted to open up his country to other nations as well as Italy, which was not what Mussolini intended. Increasingly, he saw war as the only answer. In December 1934, his forces provoked a clash with Abyssinian troops at an oasis in the Ogaden region, well inside Abyssinian territory. Italy demanded an indemnity and began to reinforce her troops in Eritrea and Italian Somaliland. Emperor Haile Selassie appealed in person to the League of Nations, which took little notice, since it was much more concerned with German rearmament. This encouraged Mussolini still further in his plan to invade, the more so when British Foreign Secretary Antony Eden, fearful that Italy might leave the League, visited Rome in June 1935 and tried to make a deal with Mussolini in which, in return for the Ogaden, Italy would allow Abyssinia a Red Sea port. Mussolini was not to be fobbed off, and in early October 1935, after the end of the rainy season, invaded from Eritrea and Italian Somaliland. In spite of the difficulties of the terrain, the ill-equipped Abyssinians stood little chance against the well-armed Italian army. They faced not only modern artillery and tanks, but an air force which constantly harried them, even on occasion using gas bombs. The reaction of the League of Nations demonstrated its weakness only too clearly. Neither Britain nor France were prepared to militarily challenge Mussolini, their forces being far too weak. True, economic sanctions were imposed, but these did not include coal or oil, both vital to waging modern war. In any event, non-members like the United States and Germany were not bound by them. The sanctions therefore had minimal effect.
After a six months campaign, Abyssinia was entirely overrun. Mussolini proclaimed it another Italian colony. Haile Selassie's pleas to the League of Nations had been in vain, and he and his family fled into exile in Britain. The League had been found gravely wanting in its efforts to prevent aggression, and not for the first time. Attention now turned to Spain, where civil war erupted in July 1936, just two months after Mussolini's conquest of Abyssinia. In 1923, General Primo de Rivera had established a dictatorship in the wake of a series of weak governments. His rule lasted for seven years and was brought to an end by the Depression. In 1931, a left-wing government came to power. Its first target was the centuries-old Spanish monarchy. King Alfonso was forced into exile and a republic created. Left and right-wing governments now alternated, polarizing political opinion. In the February 1936 elections, the parties of the left, combining in a popular front, narrowly overcame the right, which included the extremist Falange, founded by Primo de Rivera's son. This was banned, provoking street violence between left and right. Otherwise, the popular front's reform program was modest, but strikes and unofficial land seizures caused the right to fear that a communist takeover was imminent. Elements of the Spanish army became very concerned and believed that only armed revolt could ward off the communist threat. This was especially so in Spanish Morocco, where the troops had been campaigning for many years against the indigenous rifts. General Francisco Franco, the commander, raised the flag of revolt on the 17th of July, 1936. Mainland garrisons also rose, and the government responded by calling for volunteers to defend the republic. <laughs> Military uprisings in Madrid and Barcelona were quickly crushed. This left the nationalist rebels in control of the northwest, apart from coastal enclaves and part of the extreme south, leaving the republicans with the eastern half, including Madrid. Full-scale civil war now erupted, with all the ghastly atrocities that such a conflict brings. Franco still had to get his men across the Straits of Gibraltar to the mainland and asked the Germans for help. Before July was out, Juncker's Ju-52 transports from Hitler were landing in Spanish Morocco. Mussolini also sent aircraft. Soon Italian and German troops were also being sent to Spain. At the same time, Comintern in Moscow, the organization dedicated to exporting communism abroad, agreed to send volunteers and money to support the Republican cause. Britain and France became deeply concerned that the conflagration was about to spread and erupt into a European war. They declared a policy of non-intervention, although the left-wing French government of the day was deeply divided over this. They approached Italy, Germany, and Spain's next-door neighbor, Portugal, and obtained agreement from them that they would not intervene. An international non-intervention committee was set up and held its first meeting in London in early September. Hitler and Mussolini, however, in spite of agreeing with non-intervention, continued to send arms and men in increasing numbers. As a result, Russia warned that she would only be bound by non-intervention to the same extent as Germany and Italy. In Spain itself, the nationalists, increasingly supported by German and Italian aircraft, opened two fronts. In the north, they set out to clear the enclaves on the northwest coast. Simultaneously, Franco himself was thrusting north towards Madrid. The Republicans hastily constructed defenses to cover the capital. 
By the end of 1936, Madrid was enveloped on three sides and virtually in a state of siege. The Republican government had withdrawn to Valencia and Germany and Italy had formally recognized Franco as the new head of state. Hitler saw the conflict as a weapons testing laboratory. This was especially for the new tank force he was developing. And for the Luftwaffe's latest models, especially the Messerschmitt ME-109 fighter and Junkers Ju-87 Stuka dive bomber. Mussolini, fresh from the conquest of Abyssinia, was keen to show off Italy's military prowess in his pursuit of wanting Italy to be seen as a major power. He sent a large number of troops and over 700 aircraft to fly alongside Germany's Condor Legion. Newsreel scenes like these in Madrid shocked the world, and the air attack on the Basque town of Guernica in April 1937 was especially horrific, with 6,000 being killed. These operations also served to confirm popular belief that the bomber would dominate future war. Stalin's interest in Spain was more obscure. While it might have been in Comintern's interest to give active support to a left-wing government, Stalin was more concerned by the rise of fascism in Italy and Nazism in Germany. He was looking to the Western democracies to help contain them and did not want to offend them too much. Rather, he saw the Spanish Civil War as a means of keeping Germany and Italy occupied while he continued to build and improve his own armed forces. Even so, the Russians deployed some 700 tanks and 1,500 aircraft. The other foreign element on the Republican side was the international brigades. While their governments were determined to keep out of the war, many left-wing Americans, British, French and others, including Germans, volunteered to fight in Spain often being sent out under the auspices of their domestic communist parties. The international brigades played a gallant part in the fighting around Madrid, many of them being killed. Foreign volunteers, including a Roman Catholic Irish brigade, also fought for the nationalists, but their numbers were not as large. As the war ground on, so did the area held by the Republicans grow smaller and smaller. Their troops fought with great bravery and dedication, but their overall command and control system was not as efficient as that of the nationalists. This was even though some elements of the Spanish army had remained loyal to the government. This meant that when it came to pitched battle and the Republicans launched an attack, they were seldom successful. They were better in defense, and this was why the war dragged on for so long. This was especially so in the fighting around Madrid, whose defense became the symbol of the left struggle against the forces of the right. Political differences within the Republican camp also did not help. While the communists and socialists aimed for a straightforward military defeat of the revolt, the more extreme anarchists and syndicalists saw the war in terms of a mass revolution by the proletariat. The speeches of Dolores Ibaruri, La Passionaria, may have served to inspire those defending Madrid and elsewhere, but the cracks in the alliance became so wide that in May 1937, fighting broke out between the anarchists and communists in Barcelona. This did little for the overall Republican cause. The 
other main reason was that the nationalists were increasingly better supplied than their opponents. The non-intervention committee tried to blockade the Spanish coasts, with the Italian and German navies covering the east coast, the British the south, and the British and French the north. It was not effective, especially since the nationalists were able to pass supplies through a sympathetic Portugal, and the blockade did not apply to aircraft. Furthermore, from the end of November 1937, Franco was strong enough to impose his own maritime blockade. By the end of 1938, the Republicans were penned into two areas, a small one in the extreme northeast based on Barcelona and another stretching eastwards to the coast from Madrid, which continued to hold out. By this time, the foreign contingents, including the international brigades, had left Spain under a scheme drawn up by the non-intervention committee. More and more nations were recognizing Franco's government as his forces closed in for the final offensive against Madrid. An increasing number of refugees were fleeing north towards France, and in February 1939, the Republican government also crossed the Pyrenees. At the end of March, its defenders exhausted after nearly three years of fighting, Madrid finally surrendered to Franco. A month later, he declared the civil war at an end. The scars of Spain's civil war would take a long time to heal. More immediately, the French and British failure to take more positive action to stop external involvement merely served to make Hitler and Mussolini more strident and Stalin distrustful of their will to combat fascism and Nazism. The League of Nations played little part in the Spanish Civil War, but it was more directly concerned in another simultaneous crisis in the Far East. Japan has no territorial ambition in Manchuria, nor has she any intention of entering into war with China. Despite this assurance, the Japanese had seized Manchuria and now had designs on China itself. China, in the mid-1930s, was in the grip of a civil war. Its origins lay in the 1920s, when a Chinese army officer, Chiang Kai-shek, began a movement to purge China of the anarchy of the warlords, which had steadily grown since China became a republic in 1911 under Sun Yat-sen, seen here. He had died in 1925, leaving a power vacuum. Chiang Kai-shek allied himself to the Russian-sponsored Chinese Communist Party. In 1926, he began to advance from southern China towards Shanghai, the main so-called treaty port with its large Western communities whom he wanted to evict. The West hurriedly sent reinforcements to its small garrisons in Shanghai. On reaching the city, splits began to appear in Chang's government, the Kuomintang, and he turned against the communists. This served to aggravate the conflicts within China. The Japanese now overran Manchuria, partly because they felt that Chang was a threat to their settlements there. They turned it into a colony, renaming it Manchu Kuo, and installed Henry Puyi, last of the Chinese Manchu dynasty of emperors, as regent. Meanwhile, Chiang Kai-shek, now backed by Western commercial interests in China, continued his battle with the communists. They were now led by Mao Zedong, but so successful was Chiang that in October 1934, their numbers drastically reduced by his pressure on them, the communists began an epic journey, later called the Long March. This was to take them some 5,000 miles west and then north into the fastnesses of the Shenzi province in the northwest of the country. Here they established a safe haven, but were still determined to carry on the fight. Mao 
Japanese governments, increasingly under the influence of nationalist army officers, became ever more forceful in their policy towards China. Communism, Russian and Chinese, prompted Japan to sign the anti-Comintern pact with Hitler's Germany in November 1936, with Italy joining it a year later. Tension in China increased, and in July 1937, there was a clash between Japanese troops with the Japanese legation in Peking and Chinese forces. Elements of the Japanese Kwantung army crossed from Manchu Kuo into northern China, and a full-scale war erupted. The Chinese were largely taken by surprise, but once they had overcome their initial shock, they fought back fiercely. Further troops from mainland Japan were landed at Chinese ports, and by the end of the year, much of northern China and the coastal region were under Japanese control. The ruthlessness which the Japanese used to secure cities like Shanghai, and especially Nanking, whose inhabitants suffered six weeks of indescribable atrocities after its fall, shocked the world at large. As in the Spanish Civil War, it was the Japanese bombing of these cities which had most impact on the outside world. Nanking, seat of Chang's government, and Shanghai especially, suffered heavy damage and many civilian casualties. The battle for Shanghai was particularly bloody. This was since Chang believed that the longer he held out, the more likely that the Western democracies with their settlements there would give him active help. But while the scenes of slaughter plucked at Western heartstrings, Chang was to be disappointed, and Shanghai eventually fell in November 1937. No one knows how many Chinese perished during its three-month siege. Not even Japanese attacks on British and American warships persuaded the West to act. The most notorious of these was the sinking of the American gunboat Pane on the 12th of December 1937. President Roosevelt, angered especially by the 50 casualties, including two killed, proposed a naval blockade of Japan. But the British were fearful that this would lead to war. The Japanese, however, apologized. Thus, Chiang Kai-shek was left to fight on his own, though he did sign a non-aggression pact with Russia, which brought Mao Zedong's communists onto his side. Even so, the Japanese continued their remorseless drive. By autumn 1938, they had overrun Canton and were pressing the Chinese ever further westwards into the interior of their country. Chiang Kai-shek himself had been forced to withdraw his seat of government to Chongqing, deep in the Chinese interior. Britain and France merely sent protest notes to Tokyo, which were ignored. Chiang Kai-shek's stand against aggression did, however, catch the imagination of the American people. At the end of 1938, President Roosevelt did advance Chiang a $25 million loan to encourage him to continue the fight. Russian support for Chiang Kai-shek was largely passive, but there were a number of clashes with the Japanese on the northern Manchurian border, culminating in a major battle at Nomonchan in August 1939. Led by one Georgi Zhukov, who would become well known within a few years, the Russians gained a decisive victory. China fought on in the face of continuing Japanese aggression and the destruction of her towns and cities. 
Yet, apart from some American money, her plight had brought merely words of sympathy from the West. The truth was that matters nearer home were seen as more pressing than the suffering of the Chinese people. When Hitler came to power in Germany in January 1933 and began to impose his iron grip on the country, the general international view was that Germany had been punished enough. Ignoring the ruthlessness with which Hitler was eradicating all opposition to his policies, outside observers were especially impressed by the way in which Hitler was organizing the German people back to work and transforming the economy. Among the impressive construction projects that he set up was a network of superhighways, the Autobahns. Hitler, however, remained wedded not only to the aim of writing what he saw as the injustices inflicted on Germany by the 1919 peace settlement, but also to the policy of providing the German people with Lebensraum, or living room, which meant expanding Germany's 1919 borders. The first indication of this was Germany's departure from the League of Nations in October 1933, in protest at not being permitted armed forces of equivalent strength to her neighbors, especially France. Hitler now embarked on a secret expansion of military strength, which included the creation of an air force, the Luftwaffe. This would soon be unveiled to the world at large. Hitler saw it as imperative to build up sufficient armaments in order to challenge Poland over the corridor which separated East Prussia from the rest of Germany. In the meantime, he looked south to the country of his birth, Austria, whose people also spoke the German language. Chancellor Engelbert Dollfuss had, because of constant threats from both left and right, ruled the country without a parliament since 1932. In early 1934, growing unrest culminated in a workers' uprising in Vienna. Dollfuss crushed this with great severity, bringing in the army. This served to increase his unpopularity, and Hitler tried to stage a coup. Although Austrian Nazis assassinated Dollfuss, they failed, with the Austrian army once more regaining control. Furthermore, Mussolini displayed his opposition to the coup by deploying troops to the Brenner Pass on Italy's Alpine border with Austria. Consequently, Hitler was forced to back down. He was, however, encouraged by the results of a League of Nations-sponsored plebiscite held in the coal-rich Saarland in January 1935. Situated on the French border and coveted by France, it had been under League control since 1919. Now the population voted overwhelmingly to return to German rule, and a delighted Hitler sent his forces in to welcome Saarland back into the German fold. It was to be the first of a series of territorial acquisitions carried out by Hitler over the next few years. A 
At the same time, Hitler made public Germany's rearmament. The army was to be doubled in strength, with conscription being reintroduced. Pride of place was to go to the creation of three panzer divisions, the fruits of much thought and study, besides experimentation in Russia during the Weimar years. More sensational, although it had been suspected for some months, was the unveiling of the Luftwaffe. In quantity at least, this seemed to rival the air forces of Britain and France, although Hitler used bluff to make it initially appear larger than it really was. Britain was not much concerned by the increase in German army strength, but was worried about the Luftwaffe, which could directly threaten her. France, with the Maginot Line still under construction, took the opposite view. France was further angered by the Anglo-German naval agreement of June 1935, by which Germany agreed to restrict her surface fleet to one-third of the Royal Navy, with parity in submarines. While this showed clear British acceptance that Versailles was dead, it suited the British government, which feared another naval race like that before 1914. Lack of concern over submarines reflected the Royal Navy's belief that developments in sonar and the depth charge meant that the submarine was no longer the same threat as during 1914-18, a view which it would have cause to regret in a few years' time. German rearmament did, however, prompt Britain and France to begin to do the same. This marked the end of the world's attempts to ensure peace through disarmament. Even so, their rearmament was hesitant at first, Britain concentrating on expanding her air force, with the emphasis on bombers, in the belief that this weapon would be decisive in future war. Russia, too, was another nation which had been steadily arming as part of Stalin's policy of having strong modern armed forces in order to guard the communist state against external threat. By 1935, she had impressive armored forces and a large air force. Stalin had, however, developed a paranoia that his own personal position was becoming threatened. He thus began to eliminate those whom he saw as most likely to topple him. Men like Grigory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev, long part of Stalin's inner circle, were accused of being part of an international conspiracy led by exiled Leon Trotsky and sentenced to death. Others, like Army Chief of Staff Mikhail Tukhachevsky, were also eradicated as were many leading military commanders. Soon the purges spread to every corner of Russian society. Fear now drove the Russian people to revere Stalin almost as a god in what became known as the cult of personality. Back in Western Europe, Hitler made his next move in March 1936. Taking advantage of British and French preoccupation with Abyssinia, he mobilized some of his troops and sent them into the demilitarized Rhineland. This again was in direct contravention of Versailles and involved a good deal of bluff. For Germany's armed forces were in the midst of the turmoil of rapid expansion and in no way ready for war should the British and French have chosen to oppose Hitler over this move. As it was, Britain did nothing, while France merely deployed some troops to the German border and then withdrew them rather than risk war.
Hitler now ordered the construction of defences on the French border, similar to the Maginot Line. So the West Wall, or Siegfried Line, was created. He further consolidated his position by signing a pact, the Berlin-Rome Axis, with Mussolini on the 1st of November 1936. Hitler continued to dazzle. In 1936, it was Berlin's turn to host the Olympic Games, and he seized on this to put on a propaganda show par excellence to extol National Socialism and the Aryan ideal. This was matched by the party rallies held at Nuremberg in southern Germany every September. Millions paraded to demonstrate the power of mass Nazi discipline. Underneath all this glitter, another sinister development was taking place. Hitler had never relinquished his loathing of the Jews and his belief that they were largely behind the 1918 stab in the back. As early as April 1933, he had instituted a boycott of Jewish shops and banned Jews from holding public office. Two years later, through the Nuremberg laws, they were deprived of full citizenship and forbidden to marry Aryans. Propaganda against them became ever more strident, and Jews were banned from the medical and legal professions. A growing number of Jews were interned in concentration camps and endured forced labor. Many fled Germany, among them Albert Einstein, the great mathematician and physicist who settled in America. The climax came in November 1938 in what became known as Crystal Night. As a result of the murder of a German diplomat by a Polish Jew in Paris, there was an officially sanctioned looting of Jewish shops, burning of synagogues, and even murder. Thereafter, Jews were forced to wear a yellow star and often had their property forcibly seized. Outcry from other countries was muted. This was partly because of the traditional distrust of the Jews of which every European country had been guilty, but also because of the Western democracy's fear of provoking Hitler into war. Hitler also imprinted his stamp on the arts. This included public burning of books, disliked by the regime. Apart from giving Franco active support in the Spanish Civil War, Hitler made no further external move for two years after the Rhineland. He wanted to further build up his armed forces before embarking on fresh adventures. By 1938, Hitler considered them strong enough for him to turn once again to Austria. Kurt von Schuschnigg had ruled Austria since the abortive 1934 Nazi coup. He was, like Dolphus before him, determined to keep his country out of Hitler's clutches. In February 1938, von Schuschnigg discovered another internal Nazi plot and remonstrated with Hitler over it. Hitler merely accused him of ill-treating the Austrian Nazis and tension mounted. To reduce the tension, von Schuschnigg announced a plebiscite to determine whether the Austrian people wished to remain independent of Germany. On the 
12th of March, as last-minute preparations were being made on the eve of the referendum, Hitler, fearful that it might produce the wrong result, acted. He sent troops across the border. They advanced on Vienna. Complete surprise and the welcome given by Nazi sympathizers made it a bloodless invasion. On the same day, Hitler was able to announce Anschluss, or union, between Austria and Germany. Again, the Western democracies remained silent, arguing to themselves that such a union between neighboring states speaking the same language was natural. Once more, Hitler had got away with it. He moved quickly to secure his next prey, Sudetenland, the most westerly province of Czechoslovakia, and which contained a sizable German minority. Hitler encouraged the indigenous Nazis to demand full autonomy, and then threatened the Czech government with force if it refused to comply. The Czechs were not to be cowed by this, and were determined to resist Hitler's demands. This was especially since the Czech armed forces were large. A general mobilization was therefore ordered and troops deployed to the borders with Germany. Hitler, impressed by this, paused, but tension remained high throughout the summer of 1938. At the beginning of September, fearful that war was becoming imminent, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain flew to Germany to see Hitler. He met the German leader at Bad Godesberg on the Rhine. Hitler assured him that if he could have Sudetenland, he would make no further territorial demands in Europe. Chamberlain reported this to the French government and persuaded it to accept Hitler's assurance. Even so, both countries took precautionary measures, although they consisted of little more than digging air raid shelters in public parks and deploying anti-aircraft batteries in London and Paris. Chamberlain then returned to Germany. On the 29th of September, in Munich, and with Mussolini as mediator, Britain, France, Germany and Italy signed an agreement that Hitler could have Sudetenland in return for a formal declaration that he had no further territorial ambitions. The Czechs were not consulted. On the 1st of October, German troops entered Sudetenland in another bloodless victory. Chamberlain, on the other hand, flew back to London to declare, We regard the agreement signed last night and the Anglo-German naval agreement as symbolic of the desire of our two peoples never to go to war with one another again. again. To the cheers of the assembled crowd, he triumphantly brandished the agreement. His name upon it as well as mine. Hitler, also flushed with success, immediately turned east to Poland, the main thorn in his flesh. He demanded the port of Danzig, now Gdansk, at the head of the Polish corridor, and links through this to East Prussia. The Poles refused to play ball. Hitler was, however, deterred by the large Polish armed forces under Marshal Edward Smigliarits. He therefore turned back to Czechoslovakia, whose polyglot races had become unsettled by the seizure of Sudetenland. The Czech mobilization of May 1938 had failed to prevent Hitler from achieving his aim, and there was discontent with the government in Prague. As a result, the leaders of two provinces demanded greater autonomy and were sacked. 
the leader of another province, Slovakia, complained to Hitler, but was browbeaten into agreeing that his region should become a German protectorate. Disagreed, it was easy for Hitler to dismember the remainder of Czechoslovakia. On the 15th of March, 1939, Hitler formally annexed Bohemia and Moravia. He declared Slovakia a protectorate and handed over Ruthenia to Hungary. Right-wing dictator Admiral Miklos Horty's Hungarian troops immediately occupied Ruthenia, while the Germans took over the remainder of Czechoslovakia, with only a small protest from Britain. Memel, now Klaipeda, and just north of the East Prussian-Lithuanian border, was Hitler's next annexation, again on the pretext of protecting a German minority. He did this in March 1939, but Britain and France, realizing that appeasement had failed, warned him that they would stand by Poland. Mussolini had become increasingly jealous of his allies' successes and in April 1939 sent troops into Albania, which had been under Italian influence since the mid-1920s. This provoked a move by President Roosevelt, who now sought assurances from both Berlin and Rome that they would not launch attacks on other European countries. Both Hitler and Mussolini knew, however, that America was bound by her neutrality acts, passed in the mid-30s, which forbade her from giving help to either side. They therefore ignored Roosevelt's plea. They further cemented their alliance in May 1939 by signing the Pact of Steel, guaranteeing each other support in time of war. Mussolini, as would very shortly become obvious, did not realize that Hitler was intent on resorting to war sooner rather than later. Throughout the summer of 1939, the British and French had, in desperation, been wooing Moscow to help contain Hitler. The sticking point was Poland's refusal to allow Russian troops on her soil. Suddenly, in August 1939, and to the surprise of the world, German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop flew to Moscow and signed a non-aggression pact with his counterpart, Vyacheslav Molotov, on the basis of Poland being split between the two countries. This removed the traditional German fear of a two-front war, and Hitler could now mobilize his forces. The Poles, too, began to prepare for war. The German forces moved close to the Polish border under a plan drawn up in the early summer. The Luftwaffe also deployed to forward airfields. Crews were briefed on their initial targets in Poland. But on the evening of the 25th of August, as the German forces deployed to their jump-off positions, Mussolini declared that he was not yet ready for war. Hitler sent out a postponement order, which reached some of his forward units just as they were about to cross the border. This gave the Western Allies a small glimmer of hope that war might yet be averted. They looked to the Italians, who wanted to buy more time to broker a peace settlement. It was, however, all in vain. Hitler's mind was made up. On the evening of the 31st of August, he summoned the Polish ambassador for a brief audience. Next day, at dawn, the German army crossed the Polish border.
For the second time in 25 years, Europe was engulfed in war. It was to grow into a conflict many times larger and more terrifying than the Great War. 